Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Microsoft is consigning millions of PCs to the ash heaps of history well before their time, all because of new TPM and security requirements. And today, we're going to look at the reasons why to see if they actually hold up or if it's all just a clever sales ploy in disguise. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired software engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And this is a topic that has really resonated with many of you. The whole situation surrounding the Trusted Platform Module, or TPM, and making it a mandatory requirement for Windows 11. More to the point, however, an entire generation of PC hardware will be turned into e-waste before its time is truly done, and this is frustrating for a lot of people. This all starts with that mysterious TPM module we keep hearing about, so let's take a quick look at what it all means. To recap, the Trusted Platform Module, or TPM, is essentially a dedicated security microcontroller embedded within your computer's motherboard. It acts as a secure crypto processor designed to perform cryptographic operations. Its functions are varied, but crucial for modern security. It's basically a black box that runs independent of your system and the outside world as a whole. It can securely generate, store, and manage cryptographic keys. This is vital for features like BitLocker Drive Encryption, where the keys needed to unlock your data are protected by the TPM, making it that much harder for unauthorized individuals to actually access your files, even if they physically remove the drive. Beyond encryption keys, the TPM also plays a role in what's known as secure boot. Let's take a general look at the idea behind it. In a classic computer like the old original IBM PC, there was a simple ROM chip on the motherboard, and when the CPU was reset, it would start executing code at a known address inside that ROM, and that's about all there was to it. The ROM was known as the BIOS ROM for Basic Input and Output System. It contains code to do things like write text to the screen or read blocks from a disk. And so the bootloader built into the BIOS code would fetch the initial MS-DOS binary and load your system, and that in turn would load 16-bit windows on top of it if you desired. And by the time modern windows came along based on the Windows NT system, the MS-DOS middleman was then eliminated and the BIOS would actually load a Windows binary itself. Soon enough, the BIOS chips in our PCs will be replaced by more sophisticated UEFI systems, or Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. Like a BIOS on steroids, UEFI brings a number of features to the table, including graphical setup support to replace the old pure text interface. But the new UEFI goes one step further. It provides security by using the TPM. That's because before it loads your operating system, it checks the actual bits of the system binaries to make sure they were securely signed with a cryptographic signature that guarantees those bits are original and unmolested. That root of trust starts with a master platform key and can be modified by vendors with a key exchange key, or a KEK. -E There's a signature database that holds the public keys and or hashes of bits of binaries like drivers and bootloaders and so on that are known to be trusted. It's ultimately up to the motherboard manufacturer whose keys are included in the trusted list. There's also a forbidden signature database that can be updated that holds the hashes of software known to be tainted or malicious, which provides a mechanism for revoking or rolling back previously granted access. These mechanisms are all combined to securely boot the system from a cold start. The CPU, or more accurately a helper chip of some kind, invokes the UEFI, and the UEFI looks at the boot entry. It then uses the TPM to securely verify that the boot entry is from an accepted vendor, like Microsoft or Ubuntu, and if it is, it then loads the digitally signed and secure bootloader. The bootloader then loads the core of the operating system, normally in the form of its kernel, and of course that part must be signed and verified as well. So the UEFI checks the bootloader, and the bootloader checks the kernel, and the kernel checks any drivers or services that get loaded into kernel space. And depending on how your system is configured, this trust might be enforced all the way down such that you can only run programs and applications that are also trusted and cryptographically verified as safe. In a system like that, you don't worry about trojans or viruses because they simply can't operate at all. Any code that is new or different or modified is automatically rejected as insecure, so it's not a case of checking each component for virus signatures. You simply refuse to load anything that's not guaranteed to be secure. Now that's going to be overkill for most people. Beyond the components actually included and signed with the base operating system, all of your apps would then have to be signed as well, and likely have to come from an official app store of some kind. It would dramatically reduce the number of tools and apps that you'd be able to run. Now, if this sounds a bit like the Apple iPhone, it's because it is, and it's one of the reasons that the iPhone has traditionally been harder to attack. That chain of trust extends all the way down to the store apps, so that only official apps blessed by Apple can even be executed. 
We all know that from time to time, even the iPhone can be jailbroken, allowing unsigned code to be loaded. Couldn't people just do this with their UEFI PCs, negating the entire value of the security stack? Well, while jailbreaking a PC to bypass the TPM and secure boot requirements for Windows 11 is theoretically possible, it's significantly more complex and less likely than just jailbreaking an iPhone. While all iPhones are pretty much the same, the PC is a wildly diverse beast with an almost infinite combination of CPUs, motherboards, TPMs, and UEFI implementations. Bypassing it requires either exploiting UEFI vulnerabilities or disabling Secure Boot entirely. While disabling Secure Boot is possible on most systems still, there's no guarantee that the code you're trying to jailbreak and run, like Windows itself, will cooperate with you. It could conceivably one day refuse to run in an untrusted environment. But while Microsoft could mandate this ultra-secure approach, it would simply be too limiting at this time. The compromise they've struck then, instead, is to ensure that the operating system itself is safe and secure and that everything in kernel mode is fully trusted. This in turn guarantees the integrity of the operating system itself. You might still encounter a malicious payload or download that tries to do harm, but the amount of harm and the types of things that it can do will be vastly limited. It would never be able to rootkit your system or install drivers or anything highly invasive as long as the system is working as designed. It can't run around and ransomware your system files. But now that we have a handle on some of the benefits of having a working TPM in every system, perhaps it's no surprise to learn that Microsoft's decision to mandate TPM 2.0 for Windows 11 has been a point of major contention. In their view, the TPM provides a hardware root of trust, something that software alone simply cannot achieve. By requiring this modern security chip, along with relatively recent CPUs, Microsoft argues that Windows 11 can offer a significantly more secure computing experience better equipped to handle the evolving threats of today's digital world. They emphasize the increasing sophistication of cyber attacks and the need for a layered security approach where hardware plays a fundamental role. The TPM in this context is seen as a critical building block for future security innovations within the operating system. However, this focus on security through hardware has a very real and tangible impact on a large number of PC users. Despite having machines that are, in many cases, still performing admirably for everyday tasks, content creation, and even gaming, these users found themselves unable to directly upgrade to Windows 11. The lack of a TPM 2.0 chip, or in some cases, an older generation CPU that didn't meet Microsoft's current requirements, became an absolute barrier. This hardware exclusion has affected a significant portion of the PC user base, leaving many users feeling like their perfectly good technology has been prematurely relegated to the sidelines. This brings us to the core of the user frustrations that we've been hearing about. It's not just about getting the latest features of Windows 11. For many, it feels like a forced march towards new hardware. These are machines that just months or years prior were considered perfectly adequate. To be suddenly told they were just incompatible with the newest operating system, not due to performance limitations in the traditional sense, but due to a specific hardware security feature, feels unfair to many. The cost of replacing an entire PC, especially when the existing one is still functional, is not insignificant. For users on a budget, students, or those who simply don't see value in upgrading when their current machine already meets their needs, this requirement has been a major source of annoyance and some financial pressure. The feeling of being stuck on Windows 10 while it's still supported carries the underlying knowledge that eventually that support will end, potentially leaving these users in a less secure position down the line. And this situation naturally leads us to a critical question. Is the mandatory TPM 2.0 and modern CPU requirement truly solely about enhancing security for the end user, or could there be other factors at play, such as the desire to stimulate new hardware sales? It's a debate with valid points on both sides. On the one hand, the security benefits of a TPM are well documented, and we just went through them, in an increasingly interconnected and threat-filled digital world, bolstering security at the hardware level makes logical sense. However, the seeming abrupt exclusion of so many still capable machines does raise eyebrows. Could this be a way to encourage consumers and businesses to invest in new PCs, thereby benefiting both Microsoft and their extensive network of hardware manufacturing partners? It's a suspicion that many users have voiced, and it's a legitimate area of inquiry. The timing of this requirement, coupled with the fact that many of these older machines likely could run Windows 11 smoothly in terms of raw performance, fuels this line of thought. Now, for those of you who found yourselves with perfectly good machines blocked from the official Windows 11 upgrade, you might have explored some of the unofficial workarounds. These typically involve modifying the Windows 11 installation media with Rufus or similar to bypass the checks for TPM and CPU compatibility. While these methods can indeed allow you to install and run Windows 11 on unsupported hardware, it's absolutely crucial to understand the potential downsides and the risks involved. 
Microsoft has explicitly warned that devices installed in this matter may not receive updates, including critical security updates. Running an operating system without regular security patches is a significant risk, and as it leaves your system vulnerable to newly discovered exploits and malware. While the allure of running the latest OS on your existing hardware is strong, you need to carefully weigh that against the potential security implications of not receiving updates if it comes to that. It's a trade-off that each individual user has to consider. Furthermore, this situation has significant environmental ramifications. By essentially rendering millions of PCs incompatible with the latest operating system, even if they're still perfectly functional for many tasks, we contribute to the growing mountain of electronic waste, or e-waste. The production of new computer hardware has a considerable environmental footprint, from the mining of raw materials to the energy consumed in manufacturing. Discarding perfectly usable machines prematurely exacerbates this problem. These devices, instead of having their useful lifespans extended, might end up in landfills where their unused bits can leach out into the environment. The environmental cost of this forced obsolescence is a serious consideration that often gets overlooked in discussions about software upgrades. When we look at Microsoft's broader business objectives, it's also worth considering the potential ties to their hardware partners. The PC ecosystem is vast, and Microsoft collaborates closely with numerous hardware manufacturers. A push towards newer hardware driven by operating system requirements could indirectly benefit those partners through increased sales. Additionally, Microsoft's growing emphasis on subscription-based services like Microsoft 365 might also play a role. These services are generally designed to work best on modern, supported operating systems. By encouraging users to upgrade to newer hardware capable of running Windows 11, Microsoft could be indirectly promoting the adoption of their subscription services. While these are just speculative ramblings, they are plausible factors to consider when analyzing the motivations behind such a significant hardware requirement. To put this in historical context, we can look back at previous instances where Microsoft has previously ended support for older operating systems. The discontinuation of support for Windows XP and then later Windows 7 are prime examples. In those cases, the primary rationale was usually the increasing difficulty and cost of maintaining security and ensuring compatibility with modern hardware and software on aging platforms. However, the Windows 11 situation feels somewhat different. Many of the PCs excluded by the TPM and CPU requirements are not necessarily old or underpowered. They simply lack a specific, relatively recent security chip or a sufficiently new processor architecture. This feels less like a natural progression of technology leaving older systems behind due to performance limitations and more like a specific trendy hardware gate being erected. Looking ahead, what does this mean for the next Windows, Windows 12 or whatever the next operating system is to be? Well, if the trend continues, it's quite conceivable that future versions of Windows could impose even stricter hardware demands, potentially leaving an even larger number of currently functional PCs unable to upgrade. This could lead to a cycle of more frequent hardware replacements being necessary simply to stay on the latest version of Windows, raising concerns about affordability, sustainability, and the overall user experience. Ultimately, the mandatory TPM 2.0 and modern CPU requirements for Windows 11 have opened up a significant discussion about the balance between enhanced security, the economic implications for users, the environmental impact of potentially forced hardware obsolescence, and the broader business strategies of a major software company. It's a complex issue with no easy and obvious answers, and it has directly affected a large portion of the PC user community. So for this week, I really want to hear from you. Have you encountered the situation with your own hardware? Do you have a perfectly capable machine that was deemed ineligible for the official Windows 11 upgrade? Did you explore any of the unofficial workarounds, and if so, how did it go? Or are you content to remain on Windows 10 for the time being? Share your personal stories, your frustrations, and your perspectives in the comments below, because I do read them all. Your experiences and insights are also incredibly valuable to this conversation and help drive our weekly podcast called Shop Talk on the Dave's Attic channel. I'll put a link to a recent episode in the video description, and I hope you'll check it out. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you consider subscribing to the channel, and it'll help push us over that 1 million subscriber mark. If you assume that you're probably already subscribed to my channel, double check below as you may not ever have been. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.